Uh, first item, April 2004, free fire zone in the Abu Ghraib neighborhood. During Operation Blackjack, my troop was specifically instructed by our troop commander, a captain, that a particular sector we were moving to recon and force was now considered a free fire zone. I specifically recall him telling us that there were, quote, no friendlies in the area. And then he specifically said, quote, game on, all weapons free. My unit embraced the weapons free order by firing indiscriminately into occupied civilian vehicles and its civilians themselves. The streets were littered with numerous human and animal corpses, uh, not just men, uh, but all manner of humanity. And this is what happens when a conventional force, such as the US military, attacks a heavily populated urban area. Um, they put us in a situation, you know, we're not bad people. Uh, you know, we, we were there because we thought it was the right thing to do. We were there because we thought we were gonna make things better. We were there because we thought these people wanted us to be there. And then you show up and you realize that there's a whole bunch of people there that wanna kill you. And guess what? They look just like the folks who don't wanna kill you. So are you gonna sort them out and figure it out? Only way to ensure your survival is to make sure that you put them in the dirt before they put you in the dirt, to put it bluntly. And I'm sorry to say that. That's part of us, that's the motivation. Guys who died for fucking nothing. Guys who died for shit. And guys who joined up and, and, and volunteered their lives to be taken like that for, for something that they thought was the ultimate, uh, you know, the ultimate cause, the cause of, def of protecting our country and protecting the people of our country. participate in or observe the killing or wounding of a civilian or unarmed combatant yes is that something you can talk about no have you ever seen mutilation of bodies yes can you talk about it no how prevalent was the use of racist or derogatory terminology towards civilians if so which terms um very prevalent. Um, Haji, Sam Nigger, Camel Jockey, uh, Ahmed, Ali. I mean, it's truly, it's, it's, it's truly sad to see people um, in, the, in their darkest hour, isolated from everything that they've known, was taught to them and loved. It's, it's horrible to see how people operate outside of those things because they have no value on themselves when they're placed in environments where the people have no value for them. I think a lot of good soldiers are going to keep taking orders. And I don't think that they're orders that they want to take. And I don't think that they're going to do things that they want to do. But I think they're going to continue to do them until they're asked not to do them. This is destroying you and me and it takes away any chance that we may have a normal functional lifestyle because we've been reduced to living like animals. from Belmore, a town in Long Island, New York, 20 minutes out of Manhattan. I could see the smoke when the towers fell on September 11th. I signed up as a forward observer, one of the most dangerous, powerful jobs in the military. My job was to go out and basically annihilate the enemy 
when we received contact. I joined the army to kill people. There was a little boy on an alleyway to my left on top of a building and he was holding up a stick as if to mock having an AK-47 and he was pointing it at me pretending to shoot. I positively identified my target. I trained my weapon on him and thought for a couple minutes, I hate these Iraqis. I hate these kids who throw rocks and bricks at me. This is my chance. I can kill this kid just to take one out of the couple million of them out. It took me a lot of thinking to not pull that trigger that day. I could have killed a six-year-old boy. I could have killed someone's son, but I didn't. I believe myself to be strong. And after finding out I was stop lost, I started having panic attacks and I, I couldn't admit that, that I was mentally or emotionally broken. After trying to kill myself, I was locked up and analyzed and saw doctors and this and that. And uh, I was obviously a broken soldier and I was still set to deploy. My name is Jason Hurd. I recently completed 10 years of honorable service to my country in both the U.S. Army and the Tennessee National Guard. One day we were on another dismounted patrol through the Kendy Street area. As is policy, we are to keep all cars and individuals away from our formation. And so a car was approaching us from the front. So I began doing my levels of aggression. I held up my hand, getting, trying to get the car to stop. The car sped up. And I thought to myself, oh my God, this is it. This is someone who is trying to hurt us. And so instead of doing what I should have done according to policy and raising my weapon, instead I did what you should never do. And I took my hands off of my weapon altogether and began jumping up and down, waving my hands back and forth, trying to get this car to stop and see me. The car kept coming. And so I raised my weapon, and the car kept coming. I pulled my selector switch off of safe, and the car kept coming. I was applying pressure to my trigger, getting ready to fire on the vehicle. And out of nowhere, a man came off of the side of the road, flagged the car down, and got it to pull over. He walked around to the driver's side door, opened it up, and out popped an 80-year-old woman. Come to find out this woman was a highly respected figure in the community, and I don't have a clue what would have happened had I opened fire on this woman. I would imagine a riot. If a foreign occupying force came here to the United States, and regardless of what they told us, whether they told us they were here to free us, to liberate us, and to give us democracy, do you not think that every person that owns a shotgun would not come out of the hills and fight for their right to self-determination? First thing they tried to do was medicate me. No therapy was recommended, medications were recommended. They gave me three different medications. The first was Trazodone, the second was Paxil, and the third was Gabapentin, a generic form of Neuron. My doctor told me that PTSD treatment is not a science, that there is no science to it, and that you can mix and match these medications and something may work for you that doesn't work for another vet. And I did research on the medications that I was given. And I found out that 
the main side effect of all three medications is suicidal thoughts and suicidal tendencies. Ten thousand Iraq war vets have committed suicide. My name is Zoli Peter Goodman. I'm a proud warrior and a prouder patriot. And that's my problem with the VA. So I deliver pizzas on Wednesdays. That's what I am now, a pizza delivery boy. I was a sergeant, I was a leader. I was a very good soldier. But now I'm a pizza delivery boy who works once a week because that's the only job where I can call in a couple hours before and say, I'm still at the VA, I'm waiting in line. I'm sorry, I can't come in for a couple hours. try to do with my talks and and with my work is I try to bring the reality home here because I think that's the only way this war is ever going to end until people know the suffering that people are going through over there they're not going to ever care back here it's a it's about a lot of uh, you know abstract uh, ideology it's about freedom and democracy and, and all this other shit it's not about any of that uh, of those things when you look at the reality these people are suffering and it's because of us there were no terrorists there before we got there. There were no insurgents before we got there. People lived in relative peace and harmony, and we completely obliterated that. And it's going to be hell there for years to come. Even if we leave right now, we have screwed it up that bad. And uh, you know, doing stuff like this is my way of, of saying I'm sorry you know, to the Iraqi people. Jeffrey's death should never have happened. He was caught between the humanity of what he saw and what he had to do. My son was let down by the government who sent him to fight their war of choice and destroyed his soul. At about 11.30, Jeffrey asked me if he could just sit in my lap and I could rock him. We sat there for about 45 minutes and I was rocking Jeff and we were in total silence. It was his last place of refuge. The next day I came home, it was about quarter after seven. I held Jeff one last time as I lowered his body from the rafters and took the hose from around his neck. After Jeffrey died, we found a note in the cellar, and it said, I am truly embarrassed of the man I became. I am truly embarrassed of the man I became, and I hope you can try to remember me only as a child when I was happy, proud, and enjoyed life. tasked with uh, redecorating this room and you came in, what's the first thing you'd throw out? 
I take that shit out. Because I've been home for too long. I'm not a hero. I am alone. And I didn't do a good job.